All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, for those who are new to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, we're all about bringing science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. It's great to be able to continue the learning in these challenging times and broadcast events live into the homes uh, of parents, educators, and students everywhere. So we have just an incredible virtual field trip lined up for today. We love working with the Ripley's Aquarium of Canada in Toronto, Ontario. We're going to meet some of the education team. We're going to meet some of the aquarists, and we are going to get to check out a feeding of the sand tiger sharks. And we're doing something a little different today. We're going to go above and below the water. Uh, it is going to be an absolute blast. We've got Caitlin joining us above the water. We've got Katie who's going to join us below the water. It's going to be pretty awesome. Caitlin, I'm going to throw things to you and let's get uh, meeting the sharks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Caitlin. I am one of the educators here at Ripley's Aquarium of Canada. Thank you all for joining us. And today, as Joe mentioned, we are going to be feeding our dangerous lagoon tank. So in addition to the sharks in this tank, we have uh, two sawfish, we have green sea turtles, we have one rough tail stingray, and we have about 7,000 other smaller fish in this tank. Um, all of which are going to be getting fed right before your eyes right now. So I'm hanging out with Mel here, actually. Hi, Mel. <laughs> um, and as you'll notice, we're doing a couple things here. So when we feed the fish, we actually dim the lights. Um, so I'm going to go down to the catwalk where I'm standing. So there's lights all along this catwalk. There are lights up above that are currently a little bit dimmer. And we turn off our air lifts. So you'll notice that the water is quite still. Um, it's not usually as ripply and as wavy as it is during the day. And those are all sort of signals to the animals that we're about to feed them. So it's kind of like we're ringing a dinner bell for them to come out. Um, now, each of our aquarists who are scattered around here beside me, all around, are feeding different animals. We essentially have feeding stations uh, along the catwalk that I'm standing on for the different larger animals in this tank. So down towards the end over there, we're feeding our rough tail stingray, we're feeding our sawfish a little bit closer to me, and then we're feeding our sand tiger sharks right with me, right in front of me, and our nurse sharks get fed a little bit over there. Um, now I want you guys to just imagine that we're splitting this tank in half. So towards myself, these are where the larger species get fed. And over there, you can see two of our aquarists on the far side of the tank, sort of tossing out small uh, bits of feed for the smaller fish in this tank. And we do that so we essentially distract them at the other side of the tank away from where we're feeding our larger predators. We don't want them to accidentally get in the way and uh, be in any sort of danger here of getting eaten. So we try and keep them occupied on the other side of the tank. Now you'll notice that Mel over here has this nice long pole that she's sticking large pieces of fish on. We feed uh, our larger animals in this tank, the few species of sharks and the sawfish, uh, all dead seafood. We go through about 800 pounds of seafood uh, in a given week here. And most of that goes directly to the animals in this tank. It's got the largest animals in it, they eat the most. So that's where a lot of the food tends to go. Uh, and so we do target train them. That's what this pole is that you saw with Mel. Um, it's a form of enrichment, so it helps uh, develop trust with our animals. It also gives them a little challenge that they have to come by and pull the food off of the pole. Uh, so it gives them a little bit of stimuli, kind of like a task that they have to do to get their food. And some of the animals, a little bit to my right, so Anthony right beside me is holding a sign, actually a Superman symbol in the water, for some of our nurse sharks. Uh, that's their form of target training. And they have to go up to that Superman symbol and almost sit on it in order to get their food. Oh, there's a great view of our nurse sharks from below. Yeah, so um, in addition to the 800 pounds of seafood, we also do put vitamins into their food. Because we feed them frozen seafood, it does tend to lose a bit of the nutritional value when it's frozen. So we do supplement that by putting vitamins in to make sure that all of our animals are getting basically the same diet that they would be getting out in the wilds in the ocean. Oh, well, if you can see that, we lost a pole. So there goes someone's feeding pole. 
floating around in the water. And we're going to try and get it with a net. Good job. <laughs> um, so next to our aquarists up here that are doing the feeding, there's also someone recording how much each animal is getting. Um, it's really important that we keep track of which animal is eating what and how much. Uh, so I'm not very good at this, but our aquarists are very good at identifying all of the sharks in this tank. They each have uh, essentially freckles or little marks on their body that our aquarists know to look for so they know which animal is getting fed. So for example, we have one male uh, sand tiger shark whose name is Hawaii. He gets that name because he's got a little mark on the side of his body that looks like the Hawaiian Islands. So they know to look for that. Or we have another one named Spot Cheek. Uh, obviously he's named that because he's got a nice spot on his cheek. So they know exactly which sharks are being fed. Ooh, this looks like an awesome view. Uh, and how much they're eating. We try and feed all of our larger animals a percentage of their body weight. So it's really important that we know which animal is getting what food and how often. It's also an indicator of uh, maybe if our animal is sick, they won't be taking as much food from us as possible. So it lets us know that we might wanna uh, have another checkup, a more in-depth checkup on that animal if they don't start eating again. Now we do feed the animals, the sharks in this tank three times a week, which is quite a lot. We essentially overfeed them, just in the way of someone right here. Um, so we feed them three times a week. Sand tiger sharks like this out in the ocean would usually only find food probably once every couple weeks to once a month. So it's not as often as people would think. There's a few reasons for that. The ocean, as you can imagine, is very vast. It's very hard for these animals to find food. So oftentimes they'll actually go after weaker or sick ones. Um, and then they don't tend to get the great food that we're feeding them here. So there's a few things there. They get very spoiled, our, our animals in this tank. That's an awesome view, Katie. <laughs> and there's that Superman symbol you can see. So also being fed right now, a little bit further down is our sawfish. We have two green sawfish in this tank. We have a male and a female. Um, our female is probably the largest animal here at the aquarium. She's about 13 feet long, but sawfish can reach about 23 feet in length. So that's actually longer than a great white shark. So they can get very long. And about a third of that length is usually taken up by the saw itself. So that large uh, rostrum that's shaped like a saw. That's how they get their name. Uh, so they generally feed on all sorts of different things. Mainly in this tank, they get large pieces of fish. Uh, the smaller animals across the way from us will be getting smaller pieces of fish, as well as uh, clam, some shrimp, uh, and maybe some squid. So depending on the animal, we basically chop up our seafood into smaller pieces, depending on the size of their mouth. So larger mouth gets larger pieces, smaller mouth gets smaller pieces. And back to our sawfish. Um, there are five different species of sawfish out in the wild right now. The ones that we have here are green sawfish. They are relatives of the stingrays and the sharks in this tank. So they're all called elasmobranchs. Um, so they, an interesting fact about them is that they all have a skeleton made up of cartilage. So for those of you watching at home, I want you to do me a favor and put your hand on your nose right now and feel that sort of hard part. That is cartilage. Um, that's the part that makes up all of our elasmobranchs skeletons, our cartilaginous fishes skeletons. So they don't have any bones in their body. And this is because they need their body to be very light when they're swimming around in the ocean. And our cartilage is lighter than bone. So it makes them very, very good swimmers and very uh, mobile swimmers. Now, depending on the animal getting fed today, I also wanna take a moment to talk about their teeth. Um, despite the fact that our sharks and our sawfish and our stingrays are all in the elasmobranch family, they have very different structures for their teeth. And their teeth structure is dependent on what they tend to feed on. So for our sawfish and our stingrays, they tend to feed on things like shellfish. So shrimp, uh, some bivalves, some clams. 
um, things that have a hard exoskeleton around their body. So their teeth are actually quite flat in shape. And that's because if they had really sharp pointed teeth like our sharks do, they would actually break their teeth on those shelled organisms. So they have flat teeth that are geared more towards crushing. Whereas our sharks have the typical shark teeth that you can imagine. Uh, they're very pointed, they're very sharp, they're designed to shred fish. Now, all of those animals that I just mentioned have an interesting feature where they lose their teeth all the time. Their teeth fall out uh, when they're eating, they fall out when they get too dull. And then our sharks and our sawfish and our stingrays can regrow individual teeth. So if they lose a tooth, they usually have one right behind it that can grow in in its place. And this helps keep their teeth nice and sharp for our sharks and also great for crushing for our sawfish and our stingrays. That's really cool. It's interesting because humans only get our baby set of teeth and our adult set of teeth and then we're done. Um, our sharks, not the case. They go through thousands and thousands of teeth throughout their entire life. Now, one other thing I want to talk about is that tomorrow is a very important day here at the aquarium and around the world. It is Endangered Species Day. Um, so I wanna just highlight that all of the animals that I just mentioned are on the endangered species list in some way. Our sand tiger sharks and our sand bar sharks are listed as vulnerable species with the IUCN. Uh, and there's a few reasons for this. A lot of sharks have a very low reproductive rate. Our large sand tiger sharks have one of the lowest reproductive rates of all sharks. It takes them a long time to reach an age of maturity when they can give birth. But also they tend to only have two pups each cycle. And this is one of my favorite things to talk about with these species of sharks, as well as many species of sharks, is that they will essentially develop eggs within their body and then the eggs, when they hatch, will actually hatch inside their mother and the young will stay in there. And the one that hatches first is the most powerful, the strongest, and it will actually eat all of the other eggs inside the mother. So she only ever has two each cycle, which I think is just fascinating about sharks. Uh, but our sharks are also at risk of shark finning. So that's a practice where fishermen will catch our sharks. They will remove all of their fins and it gets used in several things like shark fin soup for one. Um, that practice kills about 100 million sharks each and every year. That's one of the main reasons that our shark populations are on a very steep decline worldwide. However, some are also uh, trapped in nets that might be discarded by fishermen or just used in unsustainable fishing practices. Those nets accidentally catch our sharks and as a result, they end up as accidental bycatch. Now our sawfish that we talked about earlier are critically endangered, the green sawfish are, but currently all five species of sawfish are either endangered or critically endangered. This is also due to uh, accidentally getting entangled in fishing nets, as well as having a slow reproductive rate. But in addition to that, our sawfish are also suffering from habitat loss because they tend to live in shallow, more coastal areas, and those areas are currently being developed quite a bit by humans. You know, we want those nice beachfront properties. So they are losing their habitat very quickly. And they're also valued for their fins, their skin, their eggs, and the feature part of their body that saw uh, is sometimes sort of a trophy for hunters to take. Now I did mention we have two green sea turtles in this tank. They do tend to shy away from this area when the sharks are being fed. Our two green sea turtles are named Chewy and Spot. And green sea turtles are another species that I want to highlight as being an endangered species. I don't know if Katie has a view of them, but they tend to be around the other side of the tank. And currently our turtles are also facing several of the things that I mentioned with our sharks and our sawfish. The coastal development is taking away their nesting sites on beaches. They can sometimes get tangled up in nets as bycatch, but they also have plastic pollution that they are contending with. Uh, evidence is always coming out almost daily about plastic pollution in our oceans and our turtles accidentally eating it. Um, so we need to work on our plastic reduction right now, everybody. But they're also harvested by humans. This is still legal in some places, um, but it's also they're being illegally poached in other places. So I don't know if we have any questions ready to go, Joe, but I can keep talking if you want. <laughs> 
All right, I'm gonna come back. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're gonna, it's just getting lost in uh, the underwater <laughs> views. It's great to see the top views and switch to the bottom. Really awesome stuff. Uh, Caitlin and Katie, thank you so much for giving us the double perspective today. Really cool. So we have hundreds of viewers tuning in via YouTube right now. So if you do have some questions, can you start sending uh, some of those into us? We also have a few who are joining us right live in the call today. So I'm going to pick on a few of our live call folks and let's see if we can grab uh, some questions. So let's start off. Let's go. I know we've got a group joining us in Ottawa today. Let me turn their micro or their microphone on. How are we doing today, Ottawa? Very well, thank you. Awesome. Do you have a question about the sharks? You guys have any questions? No. Not at the moment. <laughs> That's okay. We can come back. <laughs> All right. Let's turn on another microphone here. I know we have Melissa and Samuel joining us. Let me turn that microphone on. How are you guys doing today? We're can great. I, thank you. How are you? Can I say one day? I don't remember what to say, so my mom's going to say it. We, we were reading earlier about the sharks and we read about how they breathe their water from um, above the surface that some of the sand sharks do. And so he wanted to know if they can also breathe underwater. Um, that's an awesome question. Thank you guys for asking. Yeah, so our, our sand tiger sharks do essentially gulp air, but it's not actually to breathe. It helps their buoyancy regulation. So it helps them float. Uh, most shark species, uh, the larger ones at least, are something called a ram ventilator. And that means that the way that they breathe is they swim through the water with their mouth slightly open. And as they're swimming, water goes through their mouth and passes over top of their gills. And their gills are essentially like your lungs. That's where the oxygen is actually taken out of the water. And then it goes through their body to power their muscles and their movements. There are some species of shark. They tend to be smaller sharks that live in more coral reef areas. And as you can imagine, coral reef areas are more intricate. Uh, they're more complex and they're not open to that sort of constant swimming motion that our larger open sea sharks tend to be able to inhabit. So they have uh, extra pumps that they can use to either pump water from the top of their body over their gills, or sometimes they'll store it essentially in their cheeks and then push it over their gills. So it really depends on what environment they live in as to what breathing strategy they have to, that works best for them. All right, thank you to our group in Virginia. We're getting a nice sea turtle view right now uh, for everybody who's tuning in, very cool. All right, I'm gonna grab a YouTube question here. We've got tons of questions coming in via YouTube. And this question always comes up uh, Caitlin, during one of the feeds, this came in from a few people, and they're wondering about the other fish in the tank. Why are the sharks ignoring the other fish? That's an awesome question. We also get that question a lot here on a daily basis when we're open uh, from guests who wonder that. Uh, it's a few reasons. Our sharks, like I mentioned, are fed three times a week, whereas sharks like this out in the ocean would only find food once every two weeks to once every month. So we do feed them more than they're used to. But we also, in my opinion, I think they've gotten lazy. They've gotten spoiled. We fillet the fish for them. We take out any parts that are hard for them to maybe digest, like pens of squid. So they get the best food possible. We basically are like a five-star restaurant for these animals. Uh, so they know they're getting good food from us. And sharks are notoriously lazy. Um, they're not going to waste the energy chasing after a fish in this tank because those fish are quite fast uh, and can also hide from them. So they're not gonna waste that energy on trying to chase around a fish in a tank when they get fed by us three times a week. All right, um, let's visit another one of our live groups uh, and then we'll come back to YouTube. because there's lots of questions from both spots. Um, this time we're going to go uh, to our group. Let me see if I can turn the right microphone on. I believe they're joining us in Arizona. Let me turn that mic on. How are you doing, Arizona? Good. Excellent. I picked the right one. Huh. I had a question about the different types of species of fish you have. Like, are there how many 
exactly type of species do you have and are any of them close to endangerment? Um, so we have lots of different species of fish in this tank. For the larger ones that we are focusing on, we have the largest species of sharks are the sand tiger sharks. Uh, we have 10 of those in this tank. They are listed as vulnerable right now. We have two sandbar sharks, which are also listed as vulnerable. We have three nurse sharks, uh, which I believe are vulnerable as well. We have two sawfish, those are critically endangered. So um, they're quite endangered out in the wild. And then we have sort of a slew of other smaller fish that are either least concern or data deficient, which means they don't have enough data to properly gauge their, their whereabouts on the endangered species list. Um, so you would probably see down from Katie's view, some yellowtail snappers, some porkfish. We have a tar two tarpons in this tank, which are a larger silverfish, uh, plus a, just a slew of other smaller tropical fish in this tank. All right, thank you, Arizona. Um, let's see. Oh, I like this one. So um, curious. Uh, this YouTube viewer is wondering about sharks and sleeping. Do the sharks actually sleep at any given time? That's a great question. Um, I love talking about this as well. So um, when I mentioned that our sharks are ram ventilators and they have to constantly swim, they do kind of sleep. It's kind of a half answer. They will shut down um, one part of their brain, but they will still have to sort of lazily move about the tank in order to breathe. And most of our sharks here are nocturnal. So oftentimes when you come here in the middle of the day, our sharks may still be cruising around the tank, but they're in essentially that state of sleeping. They're not really gauging what's going on. And it's very hard to tell because a lot of fish don't have eyelids. So it's not like they're closing their eyes to sleep. They're still open and they're still swimming. So it's just very hard to tell, but they do power down their body uh, and their metabolism. All right, let's grab one more from YouTube, then we'll go back to uh, our live groups. So this time, let's see. All right, so we have a question about keeping the tank clean. So uh, how often do you have to clean the water in the tank? How is that done? That's also a great question. Um, and I will admit we are a little behind right now on our tank cleanliness uh, because we don't have anyone coming into the building. We don't need to keep it up as much. So we've gotten a little lazy ourselves. Uh, we have a top notch filtration system. We do several things to filter our water. So we have sand filters that when the water goes to the sand filter, the sand filter is basically just a giant vat full of sand. Um, and it will, as water gets pushed through there, all of the bigger particles like fish waste or any leftover food get stuck in the sand. And then the semi-clean water uh, continues on and it's filtered in another process. So it gets sort of double filtered and double cleaned before it goes back to the tank. But we also will send divers in usually a few times a week to clean the tunnel, clean uh, the decor. So the coral, the fake coral that you see in front of us, spoiler, it's all fake. Uh, will get scrubbed down a few times a week as well. All right, let's go back to our live group. So this time we have uh, Miss Martin's hanging out with us in West Kelowna, British Columbia. Let me get that microphone turned on. And then Miss Martin's introduce uh, your friend joining us today. This is my son Bennett. Hi. And uh, with me on YouTube are the Silver Frost Learners, some kindergartners from West Kelowna, Canada. All right, excellent. Have they sent us in a question or two? Loads of questions and lots that have already been answered. So great minds think alike. We're just so <laughs> interested in this idea of the eggs hatching inside the body of the sand tiger shark. And we're wondering, is that the same for the saw shark and other sharks too? That's a great question. Um, another thing that I love talking about because it is so unique, it's not universal among shark species. Generally, the larger sharks have that kind of reproductive strategy. So just in general, there might be a few outliers, 
but most of the larger species do this, uh, it's called intrauterine cannibalism. Uh, so they have that strategy. Some of our smaller sharks, like our bamboo sharks and our epaulette sharks, will actually lay eggs. So they'll develop the egg inside their body. Males will fertilize it inside their body. And then they'll basically excrete it um, in their environment. And those eggs are usually coated in sort of an adhesive jelly-like layer. So they'll attach it strategically to uh, a rock or a reef, some area where they might be able to kind of hide this egg as it's uh, growing and developing before a baby shark hatches. So it really is species specific as to what reproductive strategy they have. Sharks tend to do them all. All right, we're going to pop back your way to see if there's another question shortly, but we're going to visit Burlington, Ontario first. We're going to jump across the country. How are you guys doing today? Hi, we're good. Thanks. How are you? I have a question. <laughs> right on. Go for it. Um, how many different sharks are there in the ocean? In the ocean? <laughs> um, I love this question because it's one that I don't actually need to answer. Um, there is currently an ever-changing uh, taxonomy of sharks. So taxonomy is how we classify sharks. Um, and as scientists discover more species in the ocean, which we're constantly doing, we know more about outer space than we do about our ocean and especially the depths of our ocean. So scientists are always discovering new species of fish. And as we get uh, more into genetic testing, we're better able to classify which fish go in what family. So right now, uh, the last I heard was there's around 500. But as I mentioned, it changes all the time as new technology comes about, which is always now. All right, I'm gonna grab one more question from YouTube. Uh, this is from Kate in Guelph, Ontario. And they're wondering how close do you think the aquarium ecosystem is to the open ocean ecosystem? Ooh, that's a, that's a great question. We try our best to mimic the conditions that these animals would see in their natural habitat. So we try and make sure that the decor we put in are things that they would generally come about in their natural habitat. We make sure that our water quality is exactly what they would encounter in the ocean, albeit probably cleaner. Um, but that being said, this ecosystem that you see in front of you, these animals would tend to be more spread out in the ocean. Um, our, our small fish would tend to be in a reef. They most likely wouldn't be this in this small of an environment. Um, they'd be very spread out because as I mentioned, the ocean is very vast. So these animals encountering each other on a daily basis is kind of the most thing that, the thing that's not representing their habitat the most. These animals would encounter each other very infrequently out in the ocean. But that's a great question. All right, let's check in with our BC class and see if another question came in. Oh, yes, actually, uh, Devin had a question. She's wondering, were these sharks born in the ocean that we're seeing today or did, were they all born in the aquarium? That's a great question. Most of the animals that you see in this tank are originally from the wild, uh, especially the larger sharks, sawfish, uh, and stingrays. That being said, we are currently working with an organization uh, called Seasark, which we uh, contribute behavioral and reproductive data on our sand tiger sharks to them. And their goal is to basically try and work with endangered species and study their reproduction so that we're able to get these animals to reproduce in captivity with the hopes of increasing those populations in the wild. Now, I do also wanna mention that we are very fortunate here in the aquarium. We have both male and female sand tiger sharks and we have done a great job of recreating their environment because they do try and mate with each other. Uh, and that's a great indication that these animals are not stressed in, in our environment. If they were at all stressed, they would not try and reproduce here. Uh, so they do try and reproduce. Uh, they're a little behind this year. Generally, their breeding season is in the early spring. 
um, but they sort of just started exhibiting their breeding behavior recently. So they're just a touch behind. Um, so you might actually see that right now we have a shark cam in our dangerous lagoon tank that you can access online anytime. And if you see anything that looks like our sharks are essentially trying to kill each other, that's actually them trying to reproduce. So they bite each other, um, they try and slow each other down, uh, and that's them trying to reproduce. All right, good to know. No need to panic if we see uh, something on the cam. Uh, <laughs> one more question I think is a great one to wrap up, especially with tomorrow being uh, Endangered Species Day. What can we do at home? I know lots of us are removed from the ocean. We live inland, we're landlocked. What are some things that we can do at home that can have an impact and help uh, ocean species, especially the sharks? Um, perfect. Well, I'm going to give you things to help all the animals in this tank because I love them all. Um, our sharks, like I mentioned, are uh, caught in bycatch often. So we work with an organization called Ocean Wise, and they promote sustainable seafood and sustainable fishing practices. So if you do enjoy seafood, I'm not judging you, I do too. Uh, I just want you to download the OceanWise app or get one of their pamphlets. And the next time you buy seafood, just check that species uh, that you're about to buy against what OceanWise considers sustainable. You wanna make sure that you're only supporting organizations that catch fish responsibly and they limit bycatch and they're not contributing to overfishing. Those are the organizations that we want to support. Uh, again, a little bit closer to home, talking about turtles, who are my favorite reptilian friends here. Oh, there's a great view of Spot. Um, I want everyone to just look at how much single-use plastic they use and see if they can reduce it. Maybe tomorrow, start skipping straws if you use them. Invest in a uh, stainless steel straw or a glass straw or something like that. Um, also, I want to mention that all of our, well, Ontario has the most native uh, turtle species of all of Canada. We have eight. And all of those species of native Ontario turtles are at risk in some way, either uh, endangered, threatened, or of special concern. So right now is their nesting season, and they're traveling a lot on roadways and doing some turtle crossing. So I just want everyone to slow down if they venture out onto the roads, especially if they're in sort of a marshy area. But also there's a great thing you can do that I always try and contribute to, where if you see a turtle, just snap a picture and note your location, and then you can send it into something called the turtle tally. And they keep track of where our native Ontario turtles are at any given time. And if they're crossing the roads frequently in some area, all that data goes to our transportation office and is used to get turtle crossing signs put up in those areas. So it's really important to make sure you know where your turtles are at all times. All right, excellent. Some great tips uh, to help out our marine and freshwater friends. Um, I wanna start off with a huge shout out to the YouTube group, a huge vocal group on YouTube today. Thanks for all of the great questions. I wanna give a big shout out to our groups that joined us live on camera today. Thanks for your great questions. And then Katie, I'm gonna turn your mic on too. Caitlin and Katie, thank you for giving us the dual perspective and all this great information about sharks uh, at the aquarium today. Well, You're thank welcome. you so our much. Pleasure. <laughs> thank you so much for having us. All right, tons of fun. Thank you so much. We can't wait for our next event, but for now we are going to sign off. Thanks so much, everyone.